all invite, been invited here and agreed to participate over the next couple of days to what we hope will be an amazing process of, of uh, sharing kindness and commitment and dedication to a cause. I said I wanted to meet other two spirits and they said, well, you should go to the bars, you should go to the strip, or you should go to the park. That's where you're going to find them. And that really hurt. I just don't know my place. You know, I, I, I don't know why I'm this way. I've never asked to be this way. I just am, and I have to learn to accept that. I couldn't, as an AIDS educator, go into a community and expect <coughs> people at the community level to learn about AIDS without dealing with many, many other social and health issues. And we really decided to do this forum uh, to create a space for discussion and exploration and to come up with a national strategic action plan so that governments can be called on to do something different than what they're doing. Um, communities, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities can actually come out and do something and be called upon to do something. <laughs> Prior to colonization, before the Europeans came into Canada, uh, I believe, honestly believe it was accepted that for being unique, for being different. The term Two-Spirit is actually a transitional term. It's, it's, it's Canadian English. And that um, there are words within Indigenous cultures uh, that actually uh, define distinct roles. Uh, like for the Navajo, it's the Nadle. In the Lakota, it's the Wingta. And uh, this morning they talked about in the Ojibwe, it's the Ogokwe. So that as um, the next generations become stronger and stronger in this uh, decolonization or recovery process, that people may begin to use words that are recognized within their own languages. A lot of the people agree that there are different terms and the meaning when you break down what the spirit really means in their own thinking or language. That's what really uh, helped me uh, quite a bit to learn more. There's a sacred gift in our, in our culture from the Creator. And th there's so many things that a two-spirited person brings to the culture that, that is different. We were part of the community and we were useful to the community in some way. Some of us were useful as healers, some of us as basket makers, some of us as um, helpers in parenting, some of us as seers, some of us as um, warriors and planters and hunters and gatherers. We had all kinds of roles. It was much like today. They were given tasks that, that ordained them uh, to respect. So, so we, we, can, we uh, I as a gay person, look forward to the day when those two cultures are bridged so that we start getting the kind of respect that the Aboriginals people traditionally gave to the Two-Spirit people. As a result of each of the gay bashings that I experienced, it made me stronger as a person. It made me realize that I needed to educate not only the Aboriginal community, but also the non-Aboriginal community of who we were, of what our roles are, and with respect to our ceremonies and our cultures and customs within our nations. This is what this is all about, is making sure that all human beings are treated with the utmost of, of human dignity. As Two-Spirit people, we want to survive today just like anybody else, but we want to survive with dignity. And no one can define our dignity but ourselves. <laughs>since the, t the day I discovered I was gay. And um, I always had this uh, soft, feminine voice and I always looked like a uh, female. Guys would always be hitting on me and they didn't know I was um, a guy. <laughs> my mom heard that um, I was uh, letting my hair down in school, so she told my grandmother that she was gonna cut my hair. When uh, my mom cut my hair that day, uh, I felt like something had been taken away from me because that's the only thing I had cherished, that I had something special for me was my hair. And she cut it to almost to my skull. Like I didn't come out directly to my family until last year, last summer. 
where I finally just put my mom at the kitchen table and I told her the truth and I told her that I was two-spirited and I was gay and she just looked at me like really you know <laughs> and she said I always knew but I always waited for you to tell me I consider myself bisexual and again I'm, I'm still like questioning my sexuality and that seems to be a common theme for me throughout my life and hopefully one day it won't even matter anymore. <laughs> HIV and AIDS is an enormous issue in the two-spirited community but there are other issues in our community in our part of the medicine wheel around the sexual health of our women. Sexual health does not just mean procreation. It doesn't mean reproductive technologies. We don't have our own people, so we don't understand the notion of menopause, and yet many of us are hitting it. We know, we pause for men in the beginning. How does the change occur now? I did struggle with alcohols and drug abuse, and one of the issues that I, I do still struggle with is sex, sex addiction. Even though I'm still in a, you know, I'm in a monogamous partner, partnership now, um, I still struggle with my own addictions around sex, because ever since I was a small child, I've been raised with sex. And so that's a long history to undo. So from that point on, I was outed in my community, and then I realized that, yes, I needed to stand up for who I was as a two-spirit man. An opportunity, a place, and time. Let's do it. Identify the issues. And then we'll start forming working groups, and we'll um, break you up into groups. There'll be a corrections subgroup, an addiction subgroup, and others. And from the issues, we'll identify what those other groups could be. Well, everyone uh, that I've talked to has gone through the searching, uh, the self-searching, and they have gone down the addictions road. You know, um, some were less fortunate. Uh, my greatest fear was suicide. Uh, and uh, I think that's so prominent nowadays in, in the younger people. And then some of the people that I've known have gone suicide because they couldn't accept uh, who they were. Now, when you have a two-spirited Aboriginal pe person, not only are they marginalized by mainstream society, they're also marginalized and discriminated against by their, the very culture that they live in. Which means I'm still in the closet. <laughs> so I've got to look my own things to deal with there. I want to be able to, to live within my community, to live as openly as possible without hiding anything and being myself. When you live in a small community and you, you know you're two-spirited, but you can't be yourself, you know, you can't express who you are. I see that as kind of the future of, uh, for two-spirit people and that communities will be healthy when you have healthy children who can be recognized for who they are when they're young so they don't have to go through this process that can be very dehumanizing. And I guess when I found out my son was, was gay, I had a hard time with it. The only sad thing about around our area was there was no support groups. Nobody that I could identify with, you know, and to be able to say, you know, how, how was it for you when you found out about your child? Uh, uh, how did you feel? How did you deal with it? I see too many young people who come from rural settings, come into the urban settings, and they become, um, they go right to the clubs, and they, they get really caught up in their life, and there's no positive. It's just an unhealthy lifestyle. And I guess that was my biggest fear, why I didn't want to accept that he was two-spirited, because I kind of waited for him to one day come in and say, Mom, I'm HIV positive. Yes, he has full-blown AIDS now. Communities uh, need to be um, educating themselves more about HIV and AIDS issues so that they can support community members who are living with this disease. I think what tends to um, stick out for myself uh, is the lack of sensitivity of, um, of frontline workers. Um, on two-spirited issues. Once people know that you're uh, gay or lesbian or transgendered or bisexual, 
um, and maybe you're HIV positive or you're diabetic or you're hepatitis C positive or you've got cancer. Uh, it just compounds and compounds and, and so it's no wonder that there's a lot of um, uh, gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, two-spirit people that struggle with mental health issues. How will we leave a legacy? How, how healthy will that legacy be? How will we be able to affect change in our community that I believe ultimately will improve everybody? And the conference allowed us to begin those discussions to maybe create new relationships, new inroads, and uh, hopefully uh, through its report and the follow-up will generate, will attract other people to the fire. <laughs> Are, we are part of the healing of our communities, um, and there's, our communities need us, and it's, it's, our, it's our responsibility to actually introduce that. It's important for two-spirit people to um, um, state who they are. Um, I believe that it prevents other um, Aboriginal people from um, things such as committing suicide, you know, because of not being accepted in their communities. And knowing that out there in Canada that there are a large number of uh, two-spirit people. I can suggest that issues around acceptance, around talking to our community about two-spirited issues, about embracing uh, it as a norm in our community, a social norm, and not just a sexual deviation. Research and research ethics and standards on Aboriginal, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, Two-Spirited issues, gay, lesbian issues, transgender, but those were legitimate research areas and they needed to be legitimized and we can't wait for five or ten years for the community to catch up to us to do that. We need, we need an advocacy group for Aboriginal people that are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. More opportunity to, dis to discuss parenting amongst lesbian couples adoptions, etc. What I think in terms of politically speaking, we need to educate our leadership in terms of uh, the uniqueness and um, distinctiveness of uh, two-spirited people and to recognize some of the issues that they face, uh, be it employment, be it uh, social, family life. Um, they need more support. So in terms of the political arena, a lot of work has to be done. Sensitize those people who are non-two-spirited people working in indigenous communities and having them uh, learn what the issues are and participate in identifying what the potential solutions are. Some of our people remember our places and culture in terms of two-spirit people um, is great and we can just kind of reach back not as far and pull it forward and go, oh, okay, let's dust these things off because we need everybody in the circle because we're getting weak as a people and there's all these social and health ills in the short term, again, we have this like education. Start wanting to become addiction free. Really, uh, if there's anything that I could implore upon my two spirit brothers and sisters, is really releasing that addiction, <coughs> whatever that addiction may be. We can affect a certain segment of the Aboriginal population, but there are people who are Christians who will always believe that homosexuality is wrong and is a sin. But it doesn't mean that we cannot work with those people and that we can't improve the future of youth who live within those communities or societies that are very homophobic. We need all the help we can get to help us get uh, over these things or through them or on, you know, around them or whatever, however people see that journey happening. Everybody's part of the circle and everybody needs to help move the, the community along. Really what we're doing is not just in terms of our own individual healing and using our own traditional approaches, but will ultimately serve our community collective and strengthen and heal them in the long run. And so finally now we have a voice and that process has begun. And so we're looking at a, a national movement and there was some speaking about international movement. So there's, there's, a, there's a huge vision. The networking that is being made today will be far-reaching, like it's not something that will last six months or a year, it's something that will go on for many years. It's kind of like a, a new territory, you know, and these are the pioneers. <laughs> the general public uh, sh will learn more, as, as I'm learning yet, you know, and it's been years. 
And at my age, you know, that you think I, I know everything, but I don't. It may have been interesting, and I certainly would encourage them next time, to begin to look at some of those issues from very specific perspectives. So very specific gay men's perspectives, very specific lesbian, very specific bisexual, transgender. I, I don't, wouldn't want to see a process that says, oh, you're all the same mass, when in fact we're incredibly diverse and different. Have more elders here from our communities to, to attend from all the directions of Canada on Turtle Island? I honestly think it was done really well. Um, it was probably too short a time frame to um, cover some of the things that should have been covered. I'm, I'm very sorry this program or this conference is very, very short. I, uh, I started an opening plenary um, talking about how I believe that some women's issues and women's agenda get lost in the grand scheme of, of, that, of the gay men's agenda. And so I'd like to look at those things and explore them a little further. I'd like to know how they did it so we could maybe do that out and do the same thing out in Winnipeg. We need more youth, women, young women, and, and, uh, and I believe transgendered as well, more transgendered people. But I think we could pr improve on that and just make it more accessible and um, bring them to the table and let them let their voices be heard. Maybe more cultural activities, like sweat lodges or round dance, healing circles sort of thing. I need people who are more like me because I start, I start thinking within myself that it's not acceptable. You just call on me, brother, when you need a hand. We all need somebody to lean on. When you start hanging around the mainstream again, or out there, it's just, the negative is all you listen to. And when you come to a place like this, it's the positive that you get back, the rejuvenation I was talking about earlier. <laughs> I learned that I don't have to lose that. I just have to accept the pride that I feel for myself and keep it there. Try never way I can. I am changing. I'll be better than I am. And a lot of people here feel that pride all the time. They don't have to come to a place like this all the time. And I have to learn from that and I have to see that. I have to accept that for myself. And that's what I learned. I just might have a problem that you'll understand. We all need somebody to lean on. When I dream, I dream in color. I wanna have not just a lover. been able to voice what I need to say on my issues and my concerns and people understand that and so we'll be able to formulate that into a, a process and hopefully look at strategic planning and an action plan that will um, begin to put those things in motion. Spirits in Motion is, is completely the mechanism or the vehicle to get us to where we need to go.